Hello and welcome to episode number 22 of the Classical Guitar Composers Podcast. As always, I am your host, Chris Hales. Glad to be joining you on a beautiful September day. If this is your first time joining me, the Classical Guitar Composers Podcast is simply a show that features original classical guitar compositions from around the globe. If you have an original piece for classical guitar that you would like to have played on this show, all you have to do is send an mp3 recording to chris at classicalguitarcomposers.com. It's that simple. My only rule is that your piece includes a recorded nylon string guitar. Simply send that mp3 to chris at classicalguitarcomposers.com and I air it on the show. We've heard some amazing pieces from all around the globe, and we will continue to. Today we will be featuring music from Australia, and I'm very much looking forward to that. I'd also like to remind you real quick, if you would like to support the show, a great way to do that is to go to classicalguitarcomposers.com and purchase sheet music. A few of my compositions are available for purchase. You can find them through that link, and that's a great way to support the show and get yourself a little something in return. So get comfortable, and let's get on with the show. So we had a pretty big show last month, and we're going to have a pretty big show next month. So today's show is probably going to be a little more concise. I'm at least going to attempt to make it that way. But nonetheless, a good show. I really enjoyed that interview with Scott Neubauer last month. If you haven't heard it, go listen to episode number 21. Uh, We had a conversation with one of our contributors to the show. And it's something, as I said in the previous episode, I'd like to do from time to time. But I very much enjoyed that conversation with Scott. Uh, Once more, I'd like to thank Scott Neubauer for coming on. And then next month, as I said, also a big show, and I've sort of hinted at it, but uh, I have another guest coming on, and this one's going to be a very self-indulgent show. It's going to be uh, some horror movie talk, and I'm really looking forward to that one as well. It is that time of year where I start to really get in that mood to uh, watch some horror movies and uh, definitely have some fun conversations about them. Believe it or not, I don't watch very much television at all. I I have, like, certain things I tune into. I will, I generally watch, um, I watch disc golf on YouTube, and, uh, I, uh, Bob Ross sometimes, and then on the weekends, uh, occasionally the wife and I will watch a movie, but this time of year, we kind of start breaking out all the horror movies and it's like two months straight of that I've been uh you know introducing some of them to my kids I've had a fascination with horror movies ever since I was a little kid first one I really ever saw was child's play I was a kid and it scared the crap out of me my mom didn't want me to watch it but I had a cousin who saw it and she was like telling us all about it we were upstairs at my grandparents house and they had this room up there where basically all the kids would go to be noisy and it was kind of creepy up there because there was this I don't know what it's like it was almost like a pantry it it was strange it was like a sort of hard to explain there was a bench that went along the entire wall sort of a bench seat sort of built right in with the wall and then right above that so you know a few feet from the ground there was a door and the door was like three feet tall and you could open it and then it was like this like storage area so there was that creepy little door anyway my cousin we're up in the creepy room and my cousin's telling us all about child's play and i'm sitting there just wide-eyed in fascination and fear i was attracted to this stuff so young i don't know what it is monsters, ghosts, ghoulies, but I sat there both afraid and fascinated, and as she described like the entire movie, and um, I thought a lot about it for 
a bit after that. I don't know how long it was because this was so long ago. But um, what I remember was Child's Play aired on TV. And I came across it. I saw the doll. I knew what it was. And I stopped. And I remember it was the part where um, the uh, the kid's mom is starting to believe the kid that the doll is possessed and uh you know she she pulls the batteries out of the doll and the doll keeps talking and it's really freaky and then uh actually it's extremely cheesy but you know when i was seven it was very freaky and and then later uh he uh attacks chris sarandon i watched like that whole sequence of stuff and my mom came in and, and started yelling at me because I was, <laughs> I was like, sitting there watching a horror movie and she's like, you're going to have nightmares. And I was like, no, I won't have nightmares. I want to see the movie. So she reluctantly, she didn't let me finish it, but she let me watch it for a few more minutes. And to, yeah, I mean, she, she could tell this was not a good idea. So she, <clears throat> she sent me to bed where I, of course, uh, commenced to have nightmares all night long about the stupid doll and for years to come after that <laughs> and I, I mean I had those nightmares forever and you'd think like that would make me never want to watch something scary again but no it only did the opposite it fueled the fire um, and now of course uh, I make my kids watch all kinds of horror movies it is that time of year where I like to start watching these things. Actually, I have checked out from the library the like remake of Child's Play they just did with Mark Hamill. I haven't seen that yet. I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm gonna be actually watching that tonight. But yeah, from I mean from then on really, it, it's never gone away. I used to. Uh, you know what? We'll just stop right there because. I'm already going to be doing a whole show about horror movies with a, a great friend and fellow hor horror movie enthusiast. And it's not going to be just us like talking horror randomly or, you know, there's actually a, a thing we're doing. We're going to have a little bit of a, a game, you might say. So we'll hit that next month. That's enough about the, the scary movies today. Maybe it's just this year. Maybe it's the, the COVID stuff, but man, I'm just, I'm I'm all about the the Halloween season this year. It's I mean it's not even October yet, but for you know Halloween if you don't know begins uh on September 1st the season. Anyway, well I think this next month's episode is going to be very fun. But here's what I think I'm going to do. Uh, I think we're going to have a sort of mini episode of the Classical Guitar Composers podcast at the top followed by this other thing I'm doing. So if you have no interest in that, don't worry. You know, I'll have a nice small show, and then you can just turn it off. Uh, you can just push stop. You don't have to keep listening. You know, if you're, if you're too scared, it's okay. But anyway, that's, that's, that's next month. I'll tell you a movie that I have not seen that looks scary to me. It's not a horror movie, but it looks very scary to me, is that movie Whiplash. I don't know if any of you have seen Whiplash, but it's about a drum instructor and a student, and this instructor is just, like, ruthless. You know, I've seen clips, and, like, Weird Al did a parody of it and stuff, but just this ruthless teacher who is just, like, awful to the student and you know throws chairs at him and whatnot demanding that the student plays better it reminds me a little bit of my violin teacher not not that she threw chairs at me and and I wouldn't say she was like that guy however she was not the nicest person in lessons you know she she's an older lady and I took lessons from her for a few years and she did not give compliments. Uh, you could never 
you never knew what you were doing right. You, you were, it was always focused on what you were doing wrong. And the lessons were at times very difficult. It was, it would get discouraging because it was, it was constant negative feedback. And maybe I'm making it sound worse than it is, but a lot of her students couldn't take it. I had a friend who, who demanded to be, uh, he went to the department chair and was like, you have to give me a different teacher. And all of her students, like, that was something they struggled with. That being said, the first time I got a compliment from her was like <laughs> the best day ever. But... I don't know if I'm doing the best job of uh, describing her teaching style because it's not like she was just... Her, her feedback was useful, but it was always focused on what you weren't doing and not like what you were getting right. But it was extremely refining. I got I improved in those, I don't know, it was like three three years or so that I studied with her more than I've ever progressed on anything in my life probably. Um, she was very difficult. I, I actually kind of pride myself now in that I was able to stick with those lessons and I improved tremendously. Uh, you know, she was, she was a very good teacher and there was another teacher, you know, we'd be in master class and he was a delight in master class. He was so, he was funny. Uh, he was really witty and he was, he was a great player. And he was extremely insightful with, uh, you know, the the context of, of the music, whatever piece we were discussing. He was very insightful in, like, you know, the, the history surrounding it. And, you know, he always had these great stories about the composer or this piece or, a you know, a performance of the piece. And I always wanted to try lessons with him. So, so after I was no longer... Um, really focusing on violin. I was just focusing on guitar. This is, you know, in college. Um, I just kind of took a a semester with him for fun. I, I kind of wanted to pick his brain a little bit. And he was a joy to be around, but the lessons were not very good. I didn't really progress at all with him. And he was very nice, but it was then that I really understood the value of, of the other instructor. And, you know, to tell you the truth, I kind of wish I had a guitar teacher like that. I have nothing bad to say about any of my guitar teachers over the years, but I would have liked one like that. There probably are some like that. Like I say, I have, my, my teacher was excellent in his own way, but I wouldn't mind having... I don't want to do it now, <laughs> but I wish I had done like a boot camp of classical guitar like I went through with violin. Because it wasn't fun. It was not fun taking lessons from her. But I got better. And like I said, the first time I got a compliment from her, I was like getting a Christmas present. It was so... I was like, really? I did a good job? I'll tell you what I need. I need a mean old lady to teach me disc golf. Because I've been disc golfing for 10 years, and I swear I have not gotten any better. I mean, I swear I get the same scores year after year. I need a mean old lady to teach me disc golf. Anyway, I'd be curious if any of you have had uh, experiences like that. But yeah, Whiplash gives me anxiety. Just just looking at trailers and, and clips of that movie, it, it gives me extreme anxiety. I, I no longer really uh, get nightmares about, you know, Chucky. But, but, the, but there are scary things in life. Okay, and before we move on, I'd like to read this email from our friend in the UK, Martin Slater. And if you remember, in the last couple of episodes, Martin and I have been discussing Julian Bream, and, you know, Martin met him and, of course, uh, gave him a piece, and we've been discussing that. Continuing on that, oh, and then, you know, of course, Julian died as we were having out these conversations. If you need to catch up on this, listen to the previous couple of episodes. Anyway, this email is titled Psychic Connections? Question mark. Chris, it was only on the 11th that I actually mentioned anything about the possibility of Julian passing. Just three days later, he actually has. Some people might scoff at the thought that there might have been some kind of vibe I picked up, but both myself and my mother and daughter have had certain interesting experiences. The first was my mother's, 
after my father died suddenly, after just four days of a holiday they were taking in Canada. At the time, June 1987, they were staying in a hostel in the Alaquin National Park, so there was absolutely no chance of any emergency attention. This traumatic event left my mother a widow in a foreign country, but she was with some friends who had emigrated from England. Before she returned to England with my father's coffin, she had the strangest experience. Whilst out walking in daylight hours, she was fleetingly conscious of the passing of my father's face. This was not colored as in life, but a shining gold image, perhaps similar to angelic images, and he was smiling. I know this sounds a little suspect, but after she returned to England, she went on a retreat to a house that was then owned by the exiled bishop of Iran. I, I can't pronounce this name. The exiled bishop of Iran. Dequani De Tafti. I'm sorry, Martin. <laughs> I to say that. Whilst in the residence, she again had the same experience of my father, but this time more prolonged. The last time it happened was in our local C of E church. We believe he was trying to tell her that all was and was going to be well. My own and my daughter's experiences are quite different. Apart from my evident ability with the dowsing rods, <laughs> yes, if I walk holding these in cylinders that guarantee I am not touching them, they regularly duly swing in an X marks the spot position. What they are actually detecting is open to question. That aside, the house we now live in, since 2000, is a Victorian terrace built to serve the then local railway workers. On a number of occasions, I heard relatively heavy footsteps at night, which I always concluded were from the next door house. More recently, my daughter tells me that on one occasion, when she was woken by somebody, or something, touching her and speaking in a rather sarcastic way. Thinking it was me, she told it to stop, and when she opened her eyes, there was nothing there. Again, you may think this is far-fetched, but an occasion came when my mortgage company sent me the original house deeds, as they had digitized them and no longer required the originals. And what do you think I found in them? A death certificate for a man who had hanged himself in the house in the 1950s. Make of that what you will, but my wife is strongly, re strongly religious and prays regularly, and I have to say we no longer have any trouble. Personally, I think all this sounds like a decent scenario for some kind of Hollywood film, and that is why I do not dismiss the thought of Julian's imminent passing, as we had been, even though briefly, in personal contact on an intellectual level, might have prompted my fond thoughts of him and even your thoughts. Psychic rant over. Now it's back to normality. Martin. Okay, so here's my response to that email. Uh, I don't know about psychic connections. However, I certainly don't dismiss anything that comes... When somebody tells me like their personal experiences they've had, I, I really don't dismiss them. I think, though, had I not had some of my own interesting experiences, that I might be a little more dismissive. But... Without getting too deep into it, I will just say this. When I was a teenager, there was a poltergeist. I guess you couldn't say living in my house, but there was a poltergeist occupying the same house as I. I don't know if that's a story you want to hear on the show or not. I have no idea. But I'll tell you what, if uh, Martin comes on for an interview... We can get into it, Martin. We can tell ghost stories. We've now uh, we've gone down a... We've opened a door that I have up to this point kept closed, but uh, I am a bit of a ghost enthusiast, which probably won't surprise any of you considering my just love of horror. But... Uh, yeah, I ghost chasing is not something I haven't done. <laughs> but I I uh thoroughly enjoyed that email from Martin. And um I you know, I've always had a fascination with the paranormal. So I'm not going to I'm not going to do ghost story podcast today. But if you uh if, if you want to send me 
your experiences, I'm interested. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about the uh, Julian Bream stuff. I guess you never know. But um, I find the I find this stuff going on like in your house and, and with your mom, Martin, uh, very, very fascinating. And I am truly sorry to hear about uh, you losing your dad like that many, many years ago. Martin told me a little bit uh, about his father and you know, getting him into classical guitar, and I, it, and that that's tough. So I'm, I was I was sorry to hear that. Martin also wrote, regarding being interviewed by yourself, I am of course flattered to be near the top of the list, but I have to give you the proviso that I am much more eloquent with written word than the spoken one. I think my accent is primarily Hampshire or Amshire, or is that like Amshire? <laughs> A lot of H's get dropped, but my vocabulary is probably more a combination of West Country Devon, parentheses, my dad, and Midlands Derbyshire, my mum, my mum, still going, approaching 92. Still, I am up for the challenge. There will no doubt be many more extraordinary revelations, particularly as I have now been studying my family history slash genealogy for 30 years. It was certainly interesting to hear your interview with Scott. Every one of us will have his own unique and fascinating story to tell. Martin. Well, let's do it, Martin. Let's do it maybe next year, a few episodes down the road, and, and maybe uh, I've got those winter blues toward that end, end stretch of winter. Be a good time to have a conversation. Uh, get me out of the winter blues. So, as always, Martin, thank you very much for your contributions to the show. I appreciate that very much. Man, I, I've been thinking, too. Scott and I briefly touched on some Grateful Dead stuff, and I, I think one of these days I might have to have just a Grateful Dead conversation with Scott. There's so many uh, places we didn't go. So, as I said, today is going to be a fairly short show. So I think with that, we will wrap up the opening. Let's take a small break and come on back, bring your iced tea, get in your comfy chair, and we're going to listen to some music that hails to us from Australia. Hey, like me, are you addicted to sheet music? Then let me tell you about Encoda. Encoda is an app that lets you practice, play, and perform your sheet music. It is a streaming service similar to Netflix and Spotify with tens of thousands of titles. That's millions of pages of sheet music available instantly at your fingertips. Subscribers have access to the finest editions from Boozy and Hawks, Baron Ryder, Chester, Novello, and many, many more. And they have received praise from Sir Simon Rattle and Joyce D. Donato. And if you're not sure, you can sign up for a free trial. Download Encoda from your app store today. That's Encoda. N-K-O-D-A. And be sure to let them know that the Classical Guitar Composers podcast sent you. Something I forgot to mention earlier was that after each episode, I post any links that the composers we feature have provided me. So you can go to classicalguitarcomposers.com and find, you know, sometimes they sell sheet music or just where you can find more on those composers. And if you hear something you like, I'd encourage you to do so. You know, another uh, great way to support the show is to just support the composers who we feature. So as I said earlier, today we are featuring some music from Australia. And I'm going to do my best. I've been looking up pronunciations. You did not provide me one, but here we go. This is my attempt. This comes to us from Etienne de la Vox. He writes, Hello, Chris. I just stumbled upon your website. Excellent work. I have written music for the classical guitar over the years. I am not a performer, and I hardly know any other guitarists, so my music slash arrangements sit on my shelves. However, my guitar music can be heard on YouTube and gets a little bit of interest, but not as much as my chord zither music, my other instrument. What I would be hoping for is if you could listen to a few of my pieces and let me know if you think they could feature in one of your podcasts. And he sent me some music, of course. And as I said at the beginning of the show, the only requirement for them to be on the show is 
for them to be classical guitar pieces actually recorded on a guitar so of course and uh etienne's got quite a few pieces and i i really like these i did not listen all the way through because i i genuinely like to hear it when i do the show i like to sit back and sip my tea and really take them in even though it's not in real time the same time as everybody else it's the closest i can get to listening to them along with all of you but he has sent me quite a few and so we'll be featuring him in a few episodes and um i'm glad to finally be able to air these this guy's been waiting since may (laughs) like i said we had a pretty long line so thank you very much etienne looking forward to these and uh, I would also say this uh, you know I kind of relate to some of what you said regarding you know not being a performer and and hardly knowing any any other guitars these days I'm not performing I used to perform a lot I used to um, you know do recitals but also like I did the restaurant thing for a long time and I really enjoy playing in restaurants oh do you those footsteps I don't know if you could hear those but uh, no that's not a ghost it's just my son jumping around above me <sighs> anyway but I'm I'm not the uh, I'm, not, I'm not a very I don't know a lot of other guitarists I don't I, I totally on me but I just don't dive into the communities like the the classical guitar societies I'm just not involved with that kind of stuff I, I don't know why I'm just not I think they're great. I probably should, and I think if I, I think if I started, I, I would probably really enjoy it and get into playing with these groups and whatnot. But um, I don't, so I understand. And partly why I started this podcast, Etienne, was to get stuff out there for people like you and I. So, and uh, I watched, you know, I was playing on YouTube, and I'd say you're certainly good enough to perform if you wanted to. <laughs> so anyway, Etienne, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I hope you become a, a listener. But either way, glad to feature some music. Okay, so if you need to, as always, this is that moment in the show where I highly recommend you push pause on the podcast, refill your iced tea, or whatever else you might be enjoying this show with. Get comfortable And let's kick back and listen to some music. The first piece by Etienne we're going to feature today is called The Green Butterfly, and this is a piece in the style of Villalobos. Thank you. 
we are going to hear a small suite called the Little Munchkin Suite. Etienne wrote for the birth of his first child, now 33 years old. There are four movements, and they go as such. Prelude, theme, lullaby, and finally, rubato waltz.
Okay, and then let's do one more. This is Variations on one of my favorite songs personally, Amazing Grace.
And there it is. We've just heard three pieces from Etienne de la Vox. Thank you, Etienne. I very much enjoyed those, and I'm looking forward to hearing more in future episodes. Be sure to tune in to the November episode this year, where we will be hearing more of Etienne's music. And with that, I'm going to wrap up the September show. I'd like to thank you very much for joining me. I'd like to thank Martin Slater for writing an email to the show. I'd like to thank Etienne once more for providing some music. I'm very much looking forward to the next episode. And remember, if you have a classical guitar piece that you would like to have featured on the show, you simply send an mp3 to chris at classicalguitarcomposers.com. Also, feel free to react to anything you hear on this show by sending an email to that same address. I'll read your email on the show. There's lots of ways to be part of this show. I'm glad to have you either way. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in October. Until then, keep on plucking.